So now that we've covered different cellular response pathways, what we've been basically saying at the end of these uh, pathways is that you have some sort of quote-unquote response. And we haven't really been looking at what that response is. So it gets confusing in terms of what the overall goal of this hormone chemical signal message is to really do in the cell and thus to do in the tissue. What do we do in the tissue? What do we do in the organ? What do we do in the system? How do we actually respond? We've just been saying response kind of arbitrarily. And this next flowchart is dedicated to showing you the actual response that happens once you do these signal transduction pathways or regular old cellular response pathways. And now I'd like to entitle this next flowchart on the idea of one hormone with many responses. And we're going to look at a great example of this in just a second. So one hormone, many responses. The key idea here is to understand that a hormone does not just make one boring old response. A hormone can be multifaceted in the way that it causes a response within the system as a whole, not just the cell, but within the whole system, the whole organism, as we'll see. So in order for you, you to understand that one hormone can have many responses, you have to understand that the target cells that are going to be, uh, the, that the hormone wants to reach actually differ, okay? Target cells differ um, in the following criteria. They either differ in their receptor type, the type of receptor that there may be, maybe it's a protein, maybe it's a glycoprotein, maybe it's something that has a different sort of chemical structure, or they differ in the way that the, the molecule, the actual molecule that can activate it, let's say, the molecule that produces the response. So it might be hormone A that produces a specific response, and then hormone B produces a totally different response if it goes on a separate receptor. So the molecule also that produces the response dictates how the target cell is basically, uh, how what the target cell is. And this is going to make a lot more sense because what we have seen is water plus lipid-soluble hormones, right? Both of which have very specific receptor types, have very specific responses. Either the, the responses can be a signal transduction pathway or it could be a different type of intracellular mechanism that we saw previously. Either we can do protein kinase activation or we can do DNA conformational shape change. So water and lipid soluble hormones are great examples of the fact that the receptor type or the molecule that produces the response, it all depends on the different target cells that are going to be activated or going to at least be binded to and then thus a response will be made. How do we sort of put this and ground this on a specific phenomenon? I think a great way to look at this is a superb example of one hormone, many effects. And our example here will be the hormone epinephrine. Epinephrine. So let me make sure I spell this right. Epinephrine. So this is a very popular hormone, otherwise known as adrenaline some of the times. And epinephrine it has a wide effect, a very wide effect on certain cells, on certain cells. And this effect will depend on the target cell. It will depend on the receptor type. It will depend on the molecule that produces the response. And thus, we're going to have one hormone with many responses. So let me show you, uh, very broadly speaking, what the responses would be. The responses would be uh, epinephrine is involved in things like glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose, breakdown in liver. So sometimes you want to take the stored form of glucose and break it down and utilize the stored glucose. And that glucose will be stored in the liver in the form of glycogen. How do you know when to break it down? Epinephrine is a message that says, liver, time to break down the glycogen because we need glucose. In addition, epinephrine will be involved in increasing blood flow. It's involved in increasing blood flow to skeletal muscles. So skeletal muscles, if you don't already know, are voluntary. Let's say you are running and you need energy and you need oxygen in those muscles that are involved in running. You are purposely running, right? You are voluntarily running, thus you need more oxygen to those voluntary muscles. Thus you will utilize the message of epinephrine. In addition, you want to make sure that other things don't get as much blood because you don't really care about those right now. Epinephrine will also decrease blood flow to certain cells. It will decrease blood flow to the digestive system. Because when you're running, let's say, you do not want to be digesting the food that's being made, that's within you, because that's a waste of resources. Right now you want to focus on just running, and thus you will decrease blood flow into areas that aren't necessary right now. 
basically what we're going to see with epinephrine is that you get these widespread, very rapid, systemic responses. That's a good word here, systemic responses. So some people have this uh, view of hormones as just doing one specific function, when in fact epinephrine is a classic example of, no, it's not like that. Hormones in, are involved in systemic functions, systemic responses all throughout the body. We're talking about the digestive system, the muscle system, we're even talking about the liver, and this is the first time we mention something like this. How does all this occur? So very briefly, we're going to look at the specific mechanism necessary to do glycogen breakdown, to increase blood flow and to decrease blood flow. So let's take a look at the liver cells, for example. So that's our first point of glycogen breakdown. That's our goal, right? That's our intracellular response that has to happen from an extracellular epinephrine message. So the liver cells, this is what's going to happen. We have epinephrine, so epi, which is our hormone. Epi binds to a specific target cell type. It has to be a specific cell, right? Just like stated over here, that has a receptor. So it actually binds to a receptor known as the beta type receptor. So beta capital B with this little extension of a line here is beta, beta type receptors. And these receptors are found on liver cells and they are found specifically, since they are receptors, on the plasma membrane. So we bind to these beta type receptors. This is going to have the following situation. Protein kinase A, PKA, is activated. When protein kinase A is activated, remember, protein kinases are things that like to, that are, are enzymes that activate things. Once they are activated, they get to phosphorylate things. They add phosphate groups to things, and that causes activation of those things that have been phosphorylated. So once you activate protein kinase A, you are then going to cause a very strong downstream effect of glycogen metabolism. Glycogen breakdown, in essence. Glycogen metabolism enzymes are going to be activated. How would they be activated, you might be asking. Well, that's because protein kinase A is active. Protein kinase A phosphorylates things. It's going to phosphorylate certain enzymes, and those enzymes will respond by doing their job of glycogen metabolism. And when you do glycogen metabolism, specifically glycogen, uh, you're going to be doing glycogen catabolism, glycogen breakdown, if you remember from our energetics lecture all the way back in Bio 1, this is going to cause glucose to be released. Look what we did here. What we needed was a message. That message has been responded to with the release of glucose. Glycogen breakdown in liver cells, specific receptor type, beta type receptor, specific molecule epinephrine, giving us this very important response of glucose release. And that means you're going to have energy spread throughout the body. Because some cells, let's say, need glucose for energy purposes right now. That's why we broke down glycogen. We don't want to store our energy. We want to use our energy. That's the whole purpose of epinephrine in the glycogen situation. Furthermore, let's look at the smooth muscle. So sometimes we have epinephrine involved in smooth muscle cells. So let's look at this pathway. Smooth muscle cells are going to be affected by epinephrine. So these smooth muscle cells are going to be cells that line the blood vessel uh, that supply skeletal muscles with blood, okay? So smooth muscle cells will be, let's say, in combination with skeletal muscles, and what's going to happen is the following. So I want to do this. I want to increase blood flow in skeletal muscles. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to sort of indirectly activate smooth muscle cells. This is how we do it. We're going to have epinephrine. Epinephrine is our message, and it binds to... Again, these receptors called beta type receptors. But now the location of the receptors is different, thus the response to those receptors will be different. Epinephrine binds to beta type receptors on the plasma membrane of whom? Of smooth muscle cells, not liver cells. So now we're going to have a different message being sent. The message is still going to be pretty much the same in the sense that it still activates protein kinase A. And now we know when protein kinase A is activated, it's going to activate certain enzymes. But specifically in this situation, when you actually activate protein kinase A, I know this is a little confusing, we don't need to get into the details. This, is, this on the other hand, also inactivates. If it's in smooth muscle cells, it inactivates uh, a certain enzyme. I'll just say an enzyme for right now. Uh, 
When you have this combination of activating pKa and inactivating, let's say, enzyme X, this is going to cause the following. Both of these scenarios will combine and cause smooth muscle relaxation. We know that if smooth muscle relaxes, if any muscle relaxes, so let's write this down as relaxation. If we know that if any muscle relaxes, it sort of vasodilates. This causes a vasodilation of those muscle cells. It causes a vasodilation, I should say, of the surrounding blood vessels because these line blood vessels that supply to the skeletal muscle. When you take these muscle cells that are lining the blood vessels and you cause them to relax and you cause vasodilation to happen, what are you going to do? You're going to take this tiny little uh, blood vessel, you vasodilate it because you're allowing it to relax and you're going to open it up. You're opening it up. What are you getting more of? This is going to ultimately increase blood flow. Our specific response has been reached right over here, like we said. So it sort of does an indirect pathway because it utilizes the smooth muscle cells to activate the blood flow necessary for the skeletal muscle cells, but nonetheless, similarity, but still a little bit of difference in terms of overall response seen. And then finally, we'll talk about this digestive system of decreasing blood flow by saying that you're going to have intestinal smooth muscle cells. Okay, we're going to be focusing on these guys now intestinal smooth muscle cells, and our goal is to decrease blood flow to the digestive system. Let's see how we do that by utilizing epinephrine. Here, we're going to have epinephrine, epi, binds to, and guess what? We're actually going to change it up. We're not going to be binding to a beta type receptor. There's actually going to be another receptor that in the smooth muscle cells that are intestinal gets activated, that it allows epinephrine to bind, and it's called the alpha type, alpha type receptors. So this is different because guess what? We're in different cells. We're in different locations. Thus, we have a different target cell, epinephrine, a different target cell receptor. Epinephrine binds to alpha type receptors. This is going to cause, I'll just say for just sake of brevity, this is going to cause different G proteins slash enzymes to be activated. So different G protein slash enzymes are going to be activated. This is going to cause smooth muscle contraction. Keyword here is contraction. Smooth muscle contraction, not relaxation. Totally the opposite. Contraction, when you have contraction of muscle, you do not have vasodilation. You actually have something called vasoconstriction. What do you think vasoconstriction ends up in as a response? The response is decreased blood flow. Now, I know this is very broadly speaking when we just say, you know, different G protein. What do you mean different G protein? You don't need to know any more than just the fact that you have a different intracellular response that causes a different overall response of decreasing blood flow. Different intracellular response causes an overall different overall response of increased blood flow. Same idea in the liver cells. Overall, hopefully you can see that epinephrine as one hormone has many different responses depending on the target cell that it reaches. Look at figure 45.8 to see all of these responses in a nice visual format.